Wow. Okay, so... This one was quite the ride. Hey, remember when I said that Act 1 was the best Archon quest up to that point? I fully knew at the time already that Act 2 was way better. Really. Act 1 felt like a well-executed version of past Archon quests. Meanwhile, this one just goes even further beyond. Even further beyond! And breaks the old standards for Genshin story writing. Okay, so um, before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge that I ran out of time to make this video. Really, I restarted the entire script. It had over 2,000 words, and I scrapped it because it was mostly an unorganized mess. Well, hopefully this won't happen again. I swear, guys, the next time I make a review video, I'm actually going to play and review it, like, before the last week of the patch. For 3.1, I'll try to release review videos before the end of Sino's banner, okay? Anyways. So, because of this unfortunate setback, I'm probably not going to go too far in analyzing the story quest. There's so many things to talk about with it, and not only that, this is one of those mini-stories that can be revisited at the end of the Sumeru storyline for a deeper dive into why it was so good. I think I could dedicate a good 25 minutes or so breaking down all the elements in a future video, but for now I'll mostly focus on discussion of Act 2 from the perspective of... still not knowing what will happen after this. So let's begin. I think we can all agree that this quest was really good. Like, the story writing, the choreography, the stakes, the emotions, the helplessness of the situation. Like, damn. It starts off incredibly unassuming. We attend the festival, have some fun, run into some trouble with Eremites, and then the dance performance gets shut down by the sages. Really, at this point, the cat is really out of the bag. Like, there's no more ambiguity. The Academia is hostile to Kusanelli, they're hostile to its people and our friends, and they need to go down. I'm not going to talk about the questline in order, so I guess I'll just expand on the Academia in this chapter right now. We've finally gotten the answer as to why people in Sumeru don't dream. It's because dreams have intellectual power, and it's being stolen and harnessed by the Academia, which means all the propaganda about dreams being unwise are just lies told to the people to pacify them to take away their desire to dream again. And they're using the power of the Akasha to harness them. Apparently this experiment was to put all people of Sumeru into one dream, lock down the city in an attempt to create a super brain. Now it seemed like the bits and pieces of dialogue we got from their end. They have good reason to do this. They believe this achievement to be of incredible importance for their goals. Whatever they are. And at various points, they were legitimately hesitant at times to keep going. It seems like there is pressure for them to carry on with this project, but currently, it's unknown why. Now there is one thing I'm confused about, but maybe I just didn't pay enough attention. If everyone is dreaming of the same day, are they awake as normal during a set time? Are the people all awake in real life during a daytime and dreaming this during a nighttime? Or are the people of Sumeru in a perpetual state of sleep and not getting up during the day? Unfortunately, I don't have the time to research this, so if anyone understands it better, be sure to tell me in the comments. Otherwise, I can just look for the answer myself. Anyways, this quest really played with our perception of time. We didn't follow the perspective of the Traveler one-to-one -one anymore. Something was wrong, and both the Traveler and us, the player, had to slowly catch up to what's going on. When they played the guessing game and guessed all the boxes correctly, it was obvious more loops happened that we didn't see. What's scary about the whole situation was that we never truly find out how many loops happened, and we no longer were sure whether the next day would be the very next loop. This was made especially powerful when the scene with Paimon crying happened, and then we got that painfully emotional flashback. It's also important to note the Traveler already met Nahida multiple times before we saw them meeting, which means so many times their memories reset, and then they had to go through the whole process all over again. Because of this, not only did we the player not understand what's going on, but so did the Traveler, and it feels like we were powerless to fix it. The element of mystery was incredibly powerful here. It was also very well executed. The use of screenshots, time skip animations, and overall upgrade in scene choreography was awesome. It felt more like a movie at times with the way scenes were handled. 
I also like the use of the Traveler's voice in the contemplation scenes and the recorded messages. We really need more speaking time for the Traveler. I, for one, don't view the Traveler as a self-insert at all. I mean, I only like self-inserts if we actually can control the direction of the story, but Genshin's story is very railroaded and predetermined. In which case, just make Aether and Lumine their own unique complex characters like everyone else. Anyways, in the Samsara scene, there were countless failures before, and we only made the breakthrough once we decided to take off the Akasha. Dia was the catalyst for this to happen, but Kusanelli didn't think Dia could catch on to what's happening. It shows there's an element of weakness in Kusanelli's judgment, which I'll dive deeper into later. There's a massive tension that we feel in each loop, as Duniazad is slowly dying from the mental fatigue of the repeated dreaming. I really felt like in each loop, that could have been the one we found the answer. So of course, once we finally made it to the end, it was too late. Duniazad was dead, and the game did everything to make us feel like we failed. Yeah. Now, Duniazad was the perfect character to put into the situation. We met her in Act 1, established a relationship through the quest to meet Kusanali, and she was beloved and valued by the people around her, like Dea and Nilu. Even in this quest itself, we had more development from her, the desire to see the performance, the fact that Dia gave up her greatsword to fund the festival for her, and her talking about her Elazar condition, even the notebook she was prepared to give the Traveler at the end of the festival, the fact that she wasn't a playable character meant that she could have legitimately died. Her character was definitely developed better than Tepe, who kind of followed a similar story arc that did result in his death, so we can't be sure she'll be saved. Honestly, after all this, Dunyazan might be one of the best NPCs in the series. So as for the slightly controversial event of her being alive at the end, yeah, that was kind of a last minute add-in it seems. I understand why people have an issue with this, and I do think her death would have been incredibly impactful and powerful for the story. I just hope this doesn't become a pattern. The first time I'm happy that the character is alive, but if it happens way too much then we won't really believe they're dead. And of course, that would cheapen the scenes where future characters would appear to die. I also felt like we were missing a payoff scene with Duniazad. It got cut short because she had to recover, but maybe that will come later. Now let's talk about Nahida. I think Nahida is the best character in this story arc without being the main focus of the plot. The Traveler is the main character, and Dunyazad was the main focus. Nahida has very subtly been getting a lot of character development and death in incredibly subtle ways. You'd have to collect little details scattered throughout the arc to get a clearer understanding. First off, she remembers everything. She went through all of these loops, potentially a hundred even, of the same events over and over. She helplessly watched as the Traveler made the same mistakes over and over, and sometimes not even able to find her and begin the process. It's an incredibly lonely journey, being limited in what you can do, and desperate to help end this madness, but each loop brings your loyal follower closer to death without any real permanent progress made. There's also the thing she said about not existing if no one knew her existence. It was played off as a joke by Paimon, but those words carry a lot of weight to them. She didn't walk amongst the people and made friends like Venti did. She didn't descend from above and get showered with praise and with loyal subjects like John Lee or Raiden. She really had nothing. She communicates through dreams but becomes forgotten and lost once the kids grow up and stop dreaming. The Traveler meeting her and befriending her was a pivotal step towards her ending her quiet suffering, an ongoing event that is referenced but cannot be the main focus in light of the current situation. Really, to say to the Traveler and Paimon that they were everything to her, it must have sounded incredibly corny. But from her perspective, it makes perfect sense. There's also her sense of inadequacy in being an Archon. She doesn't seem to know the failures of the other Archons in Inazuma and Mondstadt, and even arguably Liyue. Once she learns of the stories of the other nations, she might feel better about herself. Being the youngest and most inexperienced does give you the impression that the others are far more competent. Plus, there's the lingering legacy of Ruka Devata. From what limited knowledge we have of the remaining Hydro, Pyro, and Cryo Archons, Nahida might very well be the most caring and empathetic Archon out of all of the seven. She has the best personality we know of so far to lead her nation. 
Yes, her foundation is arguably even better than John Lee. I mean, that's at least what I think. However, her shame isn't exactly without merit. While being powerless isn't exactly her fault, she still has made mistakes in her inexperience. For example, she confidently told the traveler it wasn't any use to bring anyone else to her, thinking nothing will come of it because they can't see or hear her. When we brought Dia over, she shot down the idea. But to her surprise, Dia sensed an invisible Dunyazad's presence and disproved the Archon's assertions. This development went largely unnoticed in the greater context of the story, but it was a major lapse in judgment and a potentially fatal error that Nahida made. If the Traveler followed her advice to the dot, we would have never acquired Dia's insight. She was the one to suss out the academia for the time loop, and she was the one who brought the idea that the Akasha was extracting knowledge from its users and the plan to create a superbrain. That was then the catalyst that led to the Traveler and Paimon taking off their Akashas, which was the first major step towards solving the Samsara. So Dia was the one that ultimately helped the Traveler carry on their memories over to the next loop. So needless to say, Nahida herself became a liability, a roadblock towards collecting this information. This goes to show it's not just an overly pessimistic person who's down on themselves and underestimates her own abilities, she does indeed have some growing to do as evidenced here. At the very end, it turns out her body is still inaccessible, and so she can only hijack people's consciousness through the Akasha. So there goes Catherine, I guess. We know she's going to get her body back. She's playable after all. But more importantly, because of the characterization cleverly inserted in the Samsara event, there is a big payoff that's set off when she comes out, becomes seen by the public, and is able to finally exist together with other people and no longer be alone. That would be a massive moment for her, and we've identified the buildup leading up to this with the dream contacts, the loneliness she hints at, and all the other subtle details in the story. Okay, so brief moment to talk about Nilu and Dia. For Nilu, she recognized that she was the dreamer and was the one to end it. Her character wasn't explored much, but her dance was the perfect way to end the dream. As she controlled the dream, she also performed the perfect dance. One that cannot be replicated in real life to end off the misery and suffering of the Samsara. As for Dia, I really hope we tell her everything that happened. Especially the parts where she contributed to us ending the Samsara. She had zero impact in the final Samsara loop, so it would be really depressing if that was all she remembered. Of course, she does have some degree of deja vu from the great sword fighting, but we really need to tell her or give her a knowledge capsule. It would really help make her feel closer to us and Dunyazad, and advance her character development. Okay, now for the last bit. We surprisingly got answers about the World Forget Me quote. It was from Greater Lord Ruka Devata, and it's tied to the Conria event. Something is wrong with the Ermin soul, and I guess we need to purify it of its corruptions. That's probably the cause of the withering, to be honest. Now, there is a burning tree in Dotore's scene in the Harbinger trailer, and Kole was the one who dreamed this. Now that we know that it's not normal to dream in Sumeru, this makes Kole and the dream itself much more significant. I guess my prediction is right. Kole could return to play a huge role in the story. Now, as for the dream itself, it's incredibly likely to be Ermensul. So either Ermensul is fated to burn by the hands of the Harbingers, or we stop this outcome and protect the tree. Either way, the stakes are pretty high. So anyways, that's it for this review. Sorry it came so late and so rushed. This will be the last time I do this, I swear. Future videos will come early, and with some juicy reaction material. I might make a deeper dive into the Samsara event after Sumeru's story is finished, but we'll see. Maybe this is good enough already. It ended up being more detailed than I thought. For now, uh, I'm sure this video will become outdated as soon as 3.1 is out, but hey, I hope you still enjoyed. See y'all next time.